even though I don't get to be there right now, I feel like I'm there. So thank you. I'm really happy to be here. Um, Philip, we've been friends for a long time. And I was thinking that I know that when you decided to title this, you, you went with the title, The Glorious American Essay, 100 Essays from Colonial Times to the Present. And I wanted to ask you about that. You could have gone with something sort of softer and more tentative. Um, you could have just gone with the American essay. What, what, moved you to, what moved you to add a bit of glory? First of all, I just want to say, um, I'm, I'm so pleased to see so many familiar faces of friends, ex-students, ex-students who have become friends and so on. Um, yeah, I, I think, I think to, to use the word glorious is a kind of challenge because, um, you know, all my life I've lived in the kind of, um, let's say the, um, the, the left liberal bubble, um, which is so uh, often severely critical of America. Um, and um, I've always felt a kind of um, sneaking uh, taboo patriotism towards America. That is, I love America as a country, um, and I've traveled enough to see that um, uh, many other countries are no better and often worse. Um, so, basically, but basically, the glorious cuts two ways. You could say it's America because this book is a lot about the American idea or the American vision, um, which of course is. Um, undercut and undermined in all kinds of ways. Uh, that is, it's something that's, um, that's uh, in the process of becoming what we hope, but hasn't yet obviously uh, achieved uh, perfection. Um, so, but also Glorious refers to the essay form, which is an essay, which is a form that I'm very um, identified with and that I love. So even if you don't like America as a country, you could still like their essays. I mean, it's one of the many ways in which um, I am trying to shake things up a bit. Uh, one of the other ways is that um, I, I was looking for essays that some people would not even consider essays. Um, speeches, um, letters, sermons, art criticism. To me, these are all uh, legitimate forms of the essay because they, they track the, the mind, they track uh, thought adventures. Um, so for instance, um, you know, I put in uh, Martin Luther King's um, anti-Vietnam sermon uh, because it seemed to me um, very much a classic essay uh, in which he stated, uh, stated the, uh, the problems with his even making the speech because people said, why do you want to get involved with something that isn't civil rights? And then he worked through all the objections and he worked through his own hesitations. Uh, so the form is an essay. Um, and then uh, um, I put in uh, George Washington's farewell address to the troops. Believe me, when I started this project, um, I had never read any George Washington um, and never intended to read any George Washington. Um, but one of the things that this project gave me was the opportunity uh, to fill in a lot of gaps uh, things that I had had resisted. And, uh, and so I found out that, you know, in reading it, that it was quite an intelligent, uh, well thought out position. Um, and, and so I put that in, I put in uh, Frederick Douglass's letter uh, to his master. Um, you know, we expect Frederick Douglass to be in it in some form. Um, so, but I also put in uh, comic pieces uh, and I was really trying to to expand the notion of what is an essay. And then I, 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 yeah. And the other thing I did, and then I will stop babbling on, is um, that I, um, I looked for good essays in every discipline, not just in literature, because most of the, most of the, uh, the anthologies of, of um, essays really deal with what you might call bel lettres, which are uh, novelists, poets, fiction writers. Um, and I thought every field must have a really good essay. So for instance, um, you know, there were science writers like Lauren Isley and um, Lewis Thomas um, and uh, Rachel Carson. Uh, uh, 
In theology, it was Paul Tillich. Um, in art criticism, Clement Greenberg um, or, or Kenneth Burke. Uh, in philosophy, George Santayana. In food writing, MFK Fisher. Uh, in geography, John Brinkerhoff Jackson. Uh, so I really, I really wanted to open up the idea of what, what this, um, this grand uh, tradition of the essay was. Yeah, well, you know, Philip, you're, you're, you are without actually even a close second, the most well-read person I know, and also the most generous reader I know. I sort of feel like a lot of people, when they read, they read to find out a better way to position themselves in relation to something, a kind of defensive reader. And I feel like you're the, the best example of someone who's like an open and curious reader. And I was yeah, actually thinking- something about that, because it, it, it goes directly to the role of the anthologist. Uh, I'm a writer and I'm a teacher, but I've also become over the, over the course of years an anthologist. And so I did the Art of the Press essay, which was you know, a, a, a big success. I also did a few anthologies for the Library of America, like Writing New York and, um, and uh, American Movie Critics. And I did three volumes of this thing called the Anchor Essay Annual. Now, in being an anthologist, that draws on another part of my personality because let's say, in my day-to-day -day life, I may be just as um, sno snobbish and close <laughs> uh, as anybody else, you know? Um, but then when it comes to being an anthologist, I think this, this writer is someone who um, obviously has a big reputation and I should think about putting this person in. And so then I read their work. And then I find, um, we hope, one essay that I really love, you know? And this is true of you and writers that I don't love. Um, so I'm looking for I'm looking for something that will that will feed the conversation, and that's part of what the job of the anthologist is. It's not exactly like um, uh, like a, a writer who's who's looking for uh, for a tradition that will um, confirm him or her. You know, it's a whole different skill set. When that tone is set with this anthology right from the beginning, you chose a pretty difficult person to start with in the sense that you opened with a Cotton Mather essay. And all we know from our kind of crossword puzzle knowledge of Cotton Mather is, oh, Cotton Mather, he's a bad guy. He burned, he tried to burn a lot of witches, right? Like, and I feel like there was something about, yes, maybe you opened with it because it was the earliest essay, but I felt, no, I know, I know Philip. I think he's smiling when he puts this as the opening essay. And I, I guess I sort of was wanted to ask you a little bit about about that process when it started to fall into an entire book, like how? Well, sure. I mean, for one thing, I loved opening with Cotton Mather and ending with Zadie Smith. That was another kind <laughs> of publication, you know? Um, but um, I, I came to the conclusion, um, and it was partly um, by um, listening to Marilyn Robinson, uh, who, as we know, is a, is a Calvinist and is always sort of defending the Puritans, um, that, um, that these Puritan um, um, ministers uh, and, and leaders were quite intellectual. And, and they, um, they were actually rather learned. Uh, Cotton Mather or Jonathan Edwards were very familiar, for instance, with Montaigne, uh, with the English uh, essayists, you know, with Samuel Johnson. Um, and, and, and Cotton Mather himself, um, was uh, on the one hand, you know, somebody who who, who defended uh, scientific inoculations. Um, he knew a lot of science. Uh, he'd written about a lot of flora, for, for, flora and fauna. Um, but he also obviously had this cracked idea that they were witches. So you know, uh, so he, so in fact, his, the essay that I chose was one he wrote about poetry, in which. You know, he said basically he loved poetry, but he wasn't sure whether it wasn't a temptation to the devil. And even Homer, you know, had some sexual passages and he was worried about that, you know? So he seemed to me to be very characteristic of a, um, of a certain strand in American thought, you know? But basically I wanted to say, you know, that um, we have to get over our caricature of the Puritans and realizing that they were a little more uh, complex as thinkers and then we genuinely understand. I also think you've done quite a few acts of uh, rescue, which I guess is also part of the anthologist's 
what you know part of what you do as an anthologist there are a few people in this anthology that most people haven't heard of and one that for me was like um I had never heard of her and I fell in love with her and I had to go get the other work that was available was Mary Austin and I was wondering how you came across her did you already you know and you mentioned some of the other people that for you you were trying to save them in some way so I was curious about that as well the whole project in a way was 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 um in the name of rescue so even the even the um the the classics you know like um Emerson and Thoreau um you know uh, James Baldwin and Mencken um they they it seemed to me that um I'm very attached to this notion of um what what is it that we need to hold on to what is it that we need to preserve um and so so I had no objection to to using the classics, you know. Um, but there was so much in the past that has been forgotten um, because that's, that's the way it is in America, which is a very amnesiac society. There's so much that was forgotten. Um, and I wanted very keenly to preserve some of these writers like uh, uh, Randolph Bourne, uh, uh, John J. Chapman, um, and Mary Austin. Mary Austin, so everybody was giving me suggestions. I went to everybody, even Rivka, and I asked her for a deal. And uh, <laughs> no, especially Rivka. But anyway, um, and I was I was um, giving a talk somewhere, um, a, a gig out of town, and and um, and I was seated next to this person, uh, you know, for those um, faculty dinners after the reading, which can be very awkward. Um, Probably those those uh, those um, social events are the hardest part of of those gigs. But anyway, in this particular case, I was seated next to an English professor, and he asked me what I was doing, and I told him about uh, told him about the the project I was working on, and he said, "Have you read Mary Austin?" I said, "No, never heard of her." So then um, I went home. Um, I ordered a book. It was a fantastic book, um, and 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 it was a series of of nature essays, actually, she had a terrific prose style. So, you know, I locked out. That was an example. I, I really, I really asked everybody for, for help, and um, and they gave it to me. And sometimes they gave me too much. But and and by the way, there were a lot of dead ends. You know, a lot of things where I read and and nothing nothing turned up. You know, nothing that I could use. Um, but then there were these finds. You know. And I liked, I liked also the idea of putting in someone like Emma Goldman, you know, the anarchist. Um, you know, we think of her as a kind of rabble rouser, but we don't necessarily think of her as a writer, you know. Uh, but my friend Vivian Gornick had written a whole book about Emma Goldman, so I had to check out Emma Goldman. So you've described it a little bit, but I know something ev everyone is curious about is sort of what was the process of putting this together? You already mentioned that one element was just everywhere you went, you sort of said you have something you think I should read. Um, but I, I just, I think people would love to hear a little more about that. And like, I think and you already mentioned, you you know, you were open, you, of course you were gonna include Emerson, but you didn't include the Emerson that everyone's read already, right? You know, so I sort of feel like I, I, it would be interesting to hear how, how you made your way through that field. It's just like a wild unmarked field actually. Well, first of all, I started compiling lists, you know, um, and many were the usual suspects and then not. Um, and then um, as I read, I really kind of fell into this area, this academic area called American studies, you know? Um, and and um, I talked to some of the um, English professors at Columbia who taught American studies and they led me to, to certain things. Um, like for instance, uh, Santayana's uh, on the genteel tradition in American studies, you know, um, they, they, I began to see that there was this field, you know, side by side with literature, which was, you know, uh, the history of American thought. Um, I was very keen on 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 putting in William James, and I read so many good William James essays. He's such a fantastic essayist. Um, in some ways, I prefer him to his brother, actually. Um, Elizabeth Hardwick said that um, William James was probably the most congenial American thinker that we've ever had. 
Um, and so, um, so I, I, I read a lot of him and then I chose this one, uh, What Makes the Life Significant? Um, so, you know, I was, I was looking at, at, at the notion of, um, of important thinkers. Like for instance, I've always, I've always liked uh, Lewis Mumford. Uh, and I thought, I got to get in a piece by Lewis Mumford. Um, and so I, I put in a very charming piece that was a kind of a, a autobiographical memoir. Um, and, then, and then I thought, John Dewey. Now, John Dewey is somebody who I confess I have always read with, with a sense of boredom. Um, there's something about his, his prose style that is exactly pitched to a level of, um, of, of, of generalization or abstraction that doesn't grab me. At the same time, I'm sort of a I'm sort of a, somebody who came up in the open classroom movement, who was very very much influenced by Dewey esque ideas. Um, so I wrote to one of these uh, people who were helping me, and I said, "Please give me a Dewey essay." Um, and 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 she sent me one called "Democracy in, in America," which was a terrific essay, which was about how. There's something really wrong with the top-down pedagogical structure uh, of American education, and we need to we need to make it more democratic, and 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 give the students and the teachers more power instead of imposing this curriculum. So I thought this is a perfect example of of the kind of um, social problem uh, that that has been around for a long time and that we're still grappling with, because one of the one of the fascinating parts of this whole project was to realize how much the same problems, the same potentials keep, you know, cycling back and again and again, you know, the things that we're dealing with now, you know, are not new. We've dealt with them again and again. Yeah, and that actually is something that I sort of feel like one experiences a lot in this anthology of feeling again and again, that sensation of, oh, this feels so contemporary. This feels actually like a moment, like a now moment. I wanted to ask you, was this wasn't, I think I'm correct. You weren't always going to, you're now doing three volumes, right. three anthologies. Was it originally one anthology, but your sort of openness and curiosity were two, you were a very hungry, hungry caterpillar, or, or was it originally three? No, no, it was yeah. originally and how, one. And, and I started doing the work and I began to see, this is probably a delusion, but I began to feel that I, I got it. I knew. I knew where all the essays were. I knew. You know. I knew the field. Um, probably it would have been um, five thousand pages. You know. But I mean, one of the things that happens to an anthologist is that, you know, you 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 put it together and you think, they're gonna they're gonna attack me because I didn't put this that and that in. Sure, you know? sure, sure. If only I could get a few more hundred pages, I could satisfy everyone. I could get them <laughs> off my back. Um, so. I, I, um, I came up with a, a book that was about 1,200 pages long. Um, and I actually had to, um, I had to uh, put it in a wheelie uh, luggage to bring it into Pantheon, you know, because I couldn't carry <laughs> it. it was too heavy. So, um, so, you know, the editor said, you know, we can't do this. We can only do 845 pages. And, and, and I had a meltdown. I sulked. I really felt like, you know, they were depriving me of this, this um, groundbreaking, you know, monumental thing that I could do, you know? I could taste it. I could feel it. <laughs> so, so, um, so, and by the way, I was completely wrong. They were right. Um, they ended up giving me 900 pages. And then, and then I thought, well, maybe they'll give me another volume. Instead, they gave me two volumes. So the second volume, which is coming out um, next April, is called The Golden Age of the American Essay, 1945 to 1970. And it focuses very intently on that post-war period, um, which, which I came to the conclusion was a really good period for essays. Um, and partly it was a good period for essays because uh, as Lionel Trilling said, there was a kind of liberal consensus at the end of World War too. So I thought, you know, there's an, there's an, there's a, there's an overlap between um, liberalism and the essay philosophy, which is 
you know, said to be undogmatic, skeptical, open, and so on. Um, and so I thought maybe that maybe I can make these connections, you know. And and so the whole book becomes kind of like a a trial of liberalism, as liberalism faces, you know, not only McCarthyism but faces its own internal contradictions. Uh, and all the essays play into this notion in some way or another. So, for instance, um, I put in an essay. Um, by, uh, well, I put in this essay by um, uh, by George F. Kennan, which is a very controversial essay about the mentality of the Soviets, uh, which basically says, "Watch out for the Soviets; they're not going to be our friend." Um, what year? What? What year is that essay? I don't remember. It was about 1948, and it was in Foreign Affairs. He had written this long telegram that he signed X, which was basically saying, you know, let's at least understand the mentality of the Soviets. Um, but in a funny way, it was one of the most influential essays ever written, you know. Um, he, he later said, I never said we should go to war with the Soviets. I just said we should, we should try to spread notions of democracy and freedom to compete with them, you know. But anyway, that's another story. He went through a whole period, a whole revisionist period. Um, so, um, and then I put in this essay by Robert K. Merton, who was a great sociologist called The Self-Fulfilling Prophecy. He had, he had um, invented the idea of self-fulfilling prophecy. And he basically said that all of these things like racism and anti-Semitism were based on this flaw of the self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, so that was, that was volume two. Volume three um, is the, the new American essay, the contemporary American essay, the 21st century essay. And that one, that one really gave me trepidations for several reasons. One, I knew that I would offend many of my friends um, who I didn't put in. Um, two, as an anthologist, um, the, most, the, the easiest part of doing an anthology is the old stuff because it's already survived, even if it's been marginalized. As soon as you get to the current moment, it's very hard to see what's going to last, what's merely trendy, what, what has more endurance, you know? Um, so so I, 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 I ended that with, with kind of a, a, you know, shaking palsied hands. And, um, but then I found so many good essays that were written in the 21st century. So the, 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 the editor said it should be 600 pages. We ended up with 700 pages. So once again, I exceeded my limit, but you know, but I love this this uh, this third volume, and that's going to be come out in August two thousand twenty-one. So all of them essentially are going to come out within within one year. Um, I wish they could all come out at the same time, so that those critics who are going to lambast me would say, "Get it yeah, all done all together." <laughs> yeah. But anyway, I think I think in total it's going to be you know it seems to me uh, and modestly a monumental project, you know. No, it's absolutely a monumental project. And I like that it's not on that filmy newspaper, Norton Anthology paper. It's on real book paper, which I don't know, gives it like a different feel. Yeah, they produced a beautiful book. Beautiful book. Great. The book they made was really beautiful. And I, um, I have a sort of sappy question, but, it, but it's actually a personal question because Philip has been my friend for a long time and has been my teacher. And actually I feel that um, I don't know if I've ever you know, said this, but I actually feel that the, your personal essay anthology was like also my teacher, my teacher, a, a whole own teacher, you know, um, that opened up a lot of things to me. A lot of people I had never heard of before. Um, but I just was thinking, you know, you work in a lot of forms, you do, you've done a lot of, you know, a lot about film as well. You've written novels. But the essay is obviously sort of at the center of you. And I guess I'm trying, I'm curious, kind of if you have a kind of like primal essay experience or like if you remember how it opened itself up to you or when you fell in love with the form. Well, sure. Um, my, 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 my Paul on the road to Damascus experience yes. <laughs> um, took place in a, in, in a hammock in Wellfleet. Um, and uh, one summer I was, I was um, uh, renting a cottage um, that it actually belonged to um, Dwight McDonald and Na Nancy McDonald. And um, 
I was going through their books, which I always do. I'm a real snoop, and I always go through people's books. So if you sublet to me, know that this is going to happen. You know? um, anyway, and I saw this book by William Hazlitt, um, a Penguin paperback. Um, so I took it to the to the uh, hammock and started reading, and uh, I was immediately galvanized by his voice, which is a very hot voice. Um, that that that, and 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 you get a strong sense of a real. Um, individual person behind it. Uh, so I had been writing uh, fiction and poetry. Um, and I saw that in a way, his kind of essays could combine the, the narrative aspects of fiction with the associational aspects of the poetry that I was writing. Um, and, and Hazlitt had written in this book about his friend, his best friend, Charles Lamb, and about Montaigne. He had also written about Samuel Johnson. So next I went to Lamb and read Lamb and Lamb I really fell in love with. He's a great comic writer. And they directed me back to Montaigne. Now Montaigne, I, I had gone to Columbia as an undergraduate. I had read Montaigne in Humanities. And I thought, why are they putting this old fart, this fuddy-duddy in with Shakespeare and Rabelais and Cervantes? Why, why is he considered so important? I, you know. I was, I was a teenager and I couldn't figure it out, you know? So now I was reading it, um, you know, like around age 40 and, and um, the ceiling had fallen on my head a few times in life and, and, I, and everything Montaigne said made much more sense to me, you know? So Montaigne became my guy, he became my guy and my guide. Um, and so then I started, I started teaching uh, essays uh, down in the University of Houston. And I kept having to, to photocopy all these other books and make students, you know, uh, buy tons of books. And I thought, wouldn't it be good to do an anthology, you know? So I looked around and there was no such anthology. There were anthologies of, of, of modern, modern and contemporary, but there were no anthologies that went all the way back. And as I said, you know, I'm so interested in history in the past that, that I thought, okay, I'm going to take it all the way back to the Greeks and Romans, to Seneca and Plutarch, because Montaigne was always quoting Seneca, Plutarch, and Cicero. So I started off with Seneca and Plutarch, and I put in some of my Asian writers, like Seishan again and Kenko, uh, and then Montaigne, and I was off and running. Um, so that book, that book really did kind of define a genre in a way. And over the decades since, uh, I'd often been asked to Updated or to change it or to make some more money out of it, you know, squeeze some more money out of it because it it's like a sequel, a <laughs> sequel with less work. A sequel, exactly. <laughs> and I thought, no, I like it the way it is. I don't want to do a sequel. Okay, now I'm going to tell you how how this project came about, um, which doesn't necessarily reflect well on me. But um, there was this other anthology by John Degada about uh, the American essay, um, and somebody in the Atlantic reviewed it and wrote a very negative review. And so basically he, he doesn't really like essays. He's always putting in poems and stories instead of essays, you know? Uh, and, and this reviewer said, you really do better to look at Philip Lopez or the personal essay. So I thought, I do like essays. Um, <laughs> like essays as well as experimental essays. Degada was very good at finding experimental cutting edge things, but he really, you know, shied away from classic essays. So I thought, why don't I do something with the American essay? Out of that, out of that petty, rivalrous, competitive urge uh, came this project. You know, I think that's I think that's wonderful. I often sort of think, you know, if that if that energy could go that way instead of the other, you know, if, if that dis essentially destructive energy <laughs> could go into creative projects that are, are dominant as opposed to other forms of dominance, how great the world would be. Um, so I love that story. I will say that a lot of the, my favorite things in here were the things that were sermons um, or almost, almost like a lot of the pieces that, again, that were essays, but weren't essays. There were, um, and I guess I'm kind of, I'm kind of, I, I guess I'm kind of curious if you had any Anything that surprised you? Anything that you put in here that you really thought, though, that's really outside of my 
purview or that, you know, you mentioned some writers that you're not that, you thought you weren't that interested in or that you'd always been hostile to in some way or bored by and that you somehow actually found a way into them. I'm wondering what made its way in here that did surprise you, whether either formally or who it was or you must have been snuck up. Something must have snuck up on you in the process. Well, sure. I mean, you know, um, certainly um, with the founding fathers, like putting in something like like uh, one of the Federalist Papers, you know, it's probably the most influential set of essays in American history, but I never would have thought of them as an essay, you know? So I put them on by Alexander Hamilton. Um, but in a way, I was also trying to push back against some of the, the defining ways that the essay has been seen. You know, like all art forms, there's always a point in an art form where people say they want the pure, yeah. cinema, uh. they want the pure, uh, uh, painting, they want the pure music and so on. So, you know, for instance, um, Cynthia Ozick said, um, a pamphlet cannot be an essay. Thomas Paine cannot be an essay. So I put in Thomas Paine, you know. I love Cynthia Ozick, by the way. I think she's one of our great writers. But I disagreed with her, you know. And then um, William Dean Howells, another one of my favorite writers, said, um, an article is not an essay. So I thought, oh, well, says you. I'm going to put it in. <laughs> um, you know, and, 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 um, and then William Gass said, an academic paper cannot be an essay. I thought, but what if it's well written, you know? Um, various people said a polemic cannot be an essay. A, a, an essay must not have a point. Others said an essay must have a point. So basically, I was being very ecumenical and trying to, uh, to give room to all these possibilities. Uh, so I was, I was really thinking about the, you might say, the religion of the essay and trying to... to um, to open it up a little bit. That was just, that was what that was what led me, and that was what surprised me. And 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 uh, how did you choose to end it, given that you knew you were eventually going to do a very contemporary? I mean, you have essays in here that are after two thousand. You have some twenty first, not many. You have bit select twenty first century essays. And why did you decide to kind of go the whole? To, to, to touch the end there, since you were going to do another anthology or two more anthologies, but you were going to do a 21st century anthology. How did, how did you decide to sort of make your overall shape? They, I mean, the publisher, is, the publisher said they wanted the first volume. They didn't want to do it three volumes like, you know, to start. You know, yeah. They wanted the first one to be the whole arc because they believed that this would be the one that would sell. So the first one had to be the whole arc. And I wanted to end with Zadie Smith for a lot of reasons. First of all, I think that Zadie Smith really is um, an extremely skilled essayist who understands the form of the essay very, very well. Um, and I, I've been drawn to her essays for a long time. Second of all, just for political reasons, I like the idea of, um, of ending with somebody who was, you know, not American, yeah. Not, not quite American, yeah. you know, because this was like the, this was like the, giving the finger to Trump and all of this kind of anti-immigrant. <laughs> uh, I mean, inevitably, my politics were going to come out from, uh, from, from my selections, you know. So I like the idea of ending with her because it was, it made people think about, you know, those who, for instance, Emma Goldman, she, she didn't die in America, but she passed through America, you know. So immigrants have given us so much, you know. Yeah. So I wanted to end uh, with an immigrant and, 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 and her piece, which is essentially about Barack Obama, speaking in tongues and about herself, was really about, um, it's about pluralism. It's about how um, inevitably, um, you know, a lot of people are gonna speak two tongues. They're gonna speak two languages. They're gonna speak the one that they came from and the one that they're doing now, you know? Um, so this was my argument for, for pluralism and diversity essentially. I also wanted to ask you, you know, the little, it's almost something you don't think about until you sort of imagine the stress of doing it yourself. You have these beautiful, extremely succinct introductions of each essay that place the author very quickly, even though many of these authors are either unknown to the reader or, or the subject of many biographies. And I, 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 I think that's all, that's like such a beautiful, it's like a little, almost like a calendar of the saints that you flip through and you get a brief life of the saint. And I just, I was curious about the process of, of writing those. 
because they each one has a has a you you get a sense of the of the vastness and you get like a a little detail that actually even if you'd read a whole book about the person you might not get so i sort of feel like it has that uh zoomed out and zoomed in quality i mean were they fun to write were they difficult to write they were they were fun to write but you know i when i did the other person last year i wrote i wrote longer ones yeah um i wrote shorter ones now because i knew i i was I was with a race to, I only had a certain number of pages and I wanted to get them as much, much as possible. Um, and, and so I had to do something that was, that was, that was very quick in a sense, you know? Um, and and um, also, I don't know, I think, I, I think that I wanted the pieces to talk to each other. This is one of the other uh, underground um, sources of the book is that they're in conversation with each other. Um, so for instance, I put in this writer, John J. Chapman, a wonderful essayist, um, who wrote a piece called Coatesville about, uh, about some lynchings, which is a really hair-raising piece, very strong. All right, that has an amazing introduction where you tell us that it came from a speech he gave to only two people showed up for the, yeah. for the event. It came down to the town that had lynched these, uh, these blacks and, and, and basically, um, you know, gave them a, a, told them to, Accept their guilt for the horrible thing they'd done. So, but it's a short piece. So then I had to put in Edmund Wilson because he's really important. Um, and 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 what should I put in by Edmund Wilson? Well, to me, Edmund Wilson's um, greatness is as a uh, a biographical essay. He does these wonderful biographical essays. So I put in his essay about John J. Chapman, so people could read the Coatesville piece, and then they could go to Wilson and find out this very strange guy. You know, um, strange Extreme. Yeah, yeah. So that was a way that they that they're talking to each other, and they're also talking to each other because they're all trying to define what is the American idea, and what is the American success and failure. There's a piece in here that I love by Wallace Stegner called "The Twilight of of uh, Self Reliance," which which quotes a lot of the people in the book and summarizes a whole kind of theory of America. At this point, I think we'll like open it up to questions. I was going to encourage people if they wanted to do the questions in the chat, we could read them from there. Um, I think that's the easiest way to do it. And there's Merrick helping everyone see where you can do it. <laughs> if you don't ask questions, Rivka and I will have to keep chatting. Yeah, we'll have to keep chatting. The cutting, yeah. oh my God, yeah. oh my God. That must be painful. That is so painful. Um, there were people who, who I thought, objectively speaking, should go in, but I just couldn't find the right piece from them. To give you two examples, um, Dwight McDonald and Alfred Kaysen. Um, I just couldn't find the right piece, you know. I read tons of them and I couldn't find it. There was something about every time Dwight McDowell would start a piece that was full of life and vim, he'd say such stupid things that I'd say, no, I can't put this. <laughs> was that also because, I mean, Alfred Kaysen is one of the first writers on New York that I ever fell in love with, and who also I may have learned about from you. I'm not totally sure about that. but. You didn't need to rescue him. Was that part of it also? Where you're like, Alfred Kaysen will be okay. He'll, his He'll work okay. will continue. He'll be okay. He's looking yeah. down at me very censoriously. Um, I do want to. Um, I do want to say that um, somebody asked me about J. B. Jackson. J. B. Jackson was just a wonderful. He, his field was landscape, um, and and I once heard him give a talk at Rice University, um, and he started this magazine called Landscape. But he was a very elegant stylist. And his whole, his whole thing was to look at the American landscape, not as an idealized thing, not, not like um, the Hudson School of Painting, but what was really there, you know, with the, with the, um, you know, with the, um, the car repair shops at the edge of town and so on. And, and so, um, so he wrote this piece about coming into a city on a Greyhound bus and what it's like, you know. Um, so that's, that's if it, he's somebody who I definitely wanted to do. 
to rescue or reclaim and make them part of literature, not just part of a, a geography and landscape. So somebody asked, how was, how was um, the process of sifting? How did it change me as a writer? Um, you know, when I was working on this project, uh, a friend of mine said, well, what about your own work? You know, like, you know, as though I was, um, I was playing hooky for my writing, you know. The strange thing that I, it was, as I was reading this stuff, I felt it was my own work. Is that, is that identification? Is that imperialism? I don't know, you know, but it was like, I, I felt like you know, I was taking it in and it was becoming part of me and I was it, you know? So, um, you know, all of these um, brothers and sisters and cousins and so on and uncles, you know, um, you know, they became part of my mental life. Um, and, and, and it was an adventure. This was a great opportunity. You know, this was not particularly um, a, a profit making opportunity. By the time I had paid the permissions, you know, and, and calculated the number of hours I put in, I was probably getting a dollar fifty an hour. In any case, far below the minimal wage. Um, but it was it was an adventure. You know, I had my way. So satisfying. You know, and someone asked about methods of modern communication, which brings up just the material question throughout. You mentioned, okay, some of these things were speeches and some were pamphlets. And when you talk about sort of the golden age of the essay, that also is like kind of a golden age of magazines. So it was like a lot more print magazine. And, and, and did you, was yeah. there a sort of accidental material through line that you noticed or picked or, or were interested in, or, or maybe not so much? Or, you know, in essays that we're reading online or? Well, I mean, the third volume um, has a number of pieces that are, that are blogs that, are, that, that appeared uh, on the internet first, you know? Um, and I think that, um, you know, there's been a lot of solemn stuff said about the influence of, uh, uh, of the web on, on, on American prose. Um, frankly, I don't think it's such a, such a big problem. I think they're, they're beautifully written uh, uh, blogs and there were terribly written blogs, you know? And so, you know, as in, as in anything, poetry, uh, novels, you know, most of it's gonna be mediocre and then there's gonna be some really good stuff. Um, so I, I think that, you know, uh, that obviously these new forms of communication, um, in a way, they're, they're, they're all gravitating to the essay. If I had a fourth volume, I would have done uh, the graphic essay. And then, you know, if I had a theater, I would be programming essay films all the time. So, you know, um, there's something I think about this particular moment, which is one of, of, of great uncertainty um, and confusion um, that, that is very suitable to the essay. Instead of large philosophical systems like Hegel, we get these essays, you know, because we, we, we really are in the dark in a way. And, and, and we trust a subjective voice, and we also trust somebody thinking through something, you know, um, not necessarily a, an expert, you know, but somebody just, a, you know, uh, a cultivated human being trying to think through a problem. You know, there's a question um, in the chat about noting that, you know, some of these essayists are novelists or poets, and as you mentioned before, some of them are anthropologists, and some of them, you know, some of them are political leaders. So. But just the question is, do you think it's, I mean, in your experience trying to put this together, has that, what, does that seem unusual for someone to be ambidextrous like that, to be able to work across form? Or well, you know, everybody, all of the great American writers essentially could write a mean essay. They were good writers. Um, so um, it shouldn't surprise us that uh, uh, the Hawthorne and Melville um, you know, um, and, and uh, Dreiser and so on, um, uh, Willa Cather wrote beautiful essays, you know, they knew how, they knew how to write. Um, the one, speaking of cutting room floor, the one that I couldn't find, and I've already been berated for it, I couldn't find a Hemingway essay that I really thought worked. You know? um, but, um, but almost every uh, major writer, including Scott Fitzgerald, um, wrote, wrote really good essays. 
uh, and, and, and many of the poets wrote, wrote really great essays. Um, so, you know, it used to be considered, you used to have this expression, a man of letters. Now that's considered sexist, we can say a person of letters. But in fact, you know, you were expected to be able to move from genre to genre. You know, that, you know, you didn't, you weren't expected just to specialize. If you had a story to tell, you to tell as, a, as a short story. If you had um, a problem to work out in your mind, you told it as an essay. Someone's, someone's asking, um, did you uh, change your view? I think it's actually a question I'm curious to. Did putting this together change your view of America or American history in some way? Did it, after, did you see what, and what threads, and then they'll say, and what threads from the past did you see coming up in contemporary essays? I think that was the deepest part of the experience for me it was not a literary one, it was um, understanding um, more fully uh, American history. Um, so for instance, uh, I, I put in Frederick Douglass, which is a no brainer, but I also put in this guy named Martin R. Delaney, who was the rival to Frederick Douglass. He was the one who said, America is never gonna lose its racism. We gotta get out of here, we gotta to go to Africa, or we gotta to go to Canada. Um, and I put, in, I put an essay by Delaney, I never heard of Delaney, but suddenly I was, I was doing all this research um, and I saw there was this other flank, you know? So yes, I do feel that, um, that it changed my, my view of America, maybe made me a tiny bit more optimistic, you know, that there were always people thinking of, of solutions, you know, even if they couldn't always be put into practice. Yeah, and that relates to another question, which is uh, here in the chat, which is, because you're talking about someone that you sort of discovered along the way, do you, saying, do you feel like anthologies are the best places to turn for discovering writing beyond, you know, our own little cave? Um, and how, do you, you think, really do you think, the question is, do you think anthologies are, are the best way or, or what a, to find writers outside of your kind of taste culture? Um, and and wha so, what else do you do to get sort of outside of your taste culture and, um, so inspiration. Anthologies, you know, have the have the good side and bad side. Um, when I was when I was a, an undergraduate, um, I was often assigned to anthologies, and I, I I wasn't falling in love with the writers because it's very hard to fall in love with a writer on the basis of one piece, you know. But sometimes it would point me to to something. So I'd read a piece by George Orwell, like Politics and English Language, and then I'd read a whole bunch of other Orwell essays and say, well, he's really good, you know. But but essentially, um, there is something frustrating about anthologies in the sense of, you know, a slice, a slice, a slice, a slice. What they do, and this is controversial in a way, is that they kind of project a canon. Canon has become a kind of dirty word, you know, um, partly because um, the canon as it's come down to us uh, has been top heavy with, with dead white males um, and has seemed restrictive and not, not interested in enough uh, and enough other voices. Um, and yet I still think the notion of a canon is a useful one. So I said in the introduction that I'm really presenting a kind of smorgasbord or a conversation. But in my mind, I was thinking, I'm, pro I'm projecting in a, a canon which becomes a point to begin the conversation. So that's something an anthropology, an that's something an anthology can do. It can, it can say, okay, you know, let's start talking about this and see how much more we can do uh, and how much we can expand it. Um, so that's one of the great things about anthologies. Um, and in terms of uh, the value of a canon, it's like, what do we hold on to? What do we preserve? Which I still think is very important moving forward. We have time probably for one more question. I was gonna read it. So did, after this whole process did, um, sorry, that wasn't the one I was gonna read. Have you maintained the same level of enthusiasm for the written word throughout your career? I like asking this to you because whenever I'm down, I, I turn to Philip either literally or in my head for a bit of optimism. And the question goes on, and how would you encourage young writers and readers to continue to read and think for the simple pleasure of the life of the mind? Yeah, did you ever break up with writing? I and mean, did you ever go through one of those you know, adolescent periods that returns every once in a while? We just think. I never broke that? up with writing. Um, I never broke up with movies either, you know? All of my friends who were movie buffs uh, when I was younger gravitated to the opera or ballet or something else or just, uh, you know, um, 
became uh, hedge funders. But um, I, I, I love, I love the written word. If you know, there may have been times when I broke up with my own written word, but I've never broken up with. I always knew that there were these, uh, these wonderful books. I never was worried about retirement because I thought, oh my God, there's just so much to read. You know. Wallace Stevens once said that so much great writing that it's amazing that people aren't crushed by it, killed by the amount of great literature there is, you know. Um, so now I'm, I'm, I'm starting tentatively to reread Proust, you know, um, which I always thought I would do when I retired, but I can't wait till I retire. So, um, so yes, I, 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 I am a creature of the written word. And I think it has something to do with my, with my personality, which is that, um, you know, I, I can't be in society all the time. I need to retreat. I need to withdraw, and, and 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 books give me an opportunity to withdraw, and 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 as Charles Lamb said, I cannot think books think for me. That's beautiful, um, Philip. Thank you for putting the anthology together. Thank you to McNally Jackson for hosting us. Thank, I just think um, thank you, Maris. Thank you, everyone who came. It's great. Well, thank you for buying the book as well. If you yeah. do, yeah. Yes, you won't regret it. Good night, everyone.